Frank told me almost 140 film festivals. That's probably a record for any film. And it's going to be opening up. I'll let you tell him all about it. I'll tell you all about it in the fall. But we're delighted to have the screening of Wild Eye. Please welcome the writer-director, Frank Hall Green. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks, everyone, so much for, for coming to see Wildlife and for coming to the film festival. Um, it really means a lot to me, everyone that sees the movie, which is one of the reasons we've gone to so many festivals. We really just want people to see the film and, and spread the word. Um, I started writing it, I think, in 2008. In 2010, I went to Alaska and, and sort of took this journey, and, and then we went back in 2012 to Alaska, and we filmed um, over five weeks covering 3,000 miles of the state of Alaska. It was a beautiful trip. And then we went back to New York and we spent a big long journey editing for about a, a year or so. And then we started at the Hamptons Film Festival last October. And since then, so many other people have joined our trip, so many audiences and, and awesome programmers um, like Alan. Um, by the way, I want to thank the Stony Brook Film Festival for having us and for Alan being really persistent on me coming here. I really like to come to festivals that, yes, he is awesome. I like to come to festivals that want me to come and, and, and make an effort, and Alan really did that. And, um, and the festival really you know, wanted me to come here. I said, well, then I'm gonna come if they want me to be here. It, it wouldn't matter if there were five of you in the audience. I've certainly been to festivals where there have been three or, or four or five, but um, this is a terrific crowd. So anyway, now the movie's coming out you know, on September 25th in um, you know, 20 cities or so around USA and in Canada. And um, you know, I'll be back to tell you all about that and everything that happens in the movie uh, right after it's over. So stick around and I look forward to talking with you. Enjoy going to Alaska. Okay, well, so you gotta stick around now. He's got great things to tell you. Uh, really honored that Frank's here tonight. As I said, he's, he's been around a lot, and I really wanted him here because I know how special it is to have the filmmaker here, and it's a beautiful film. So enjoy the film, The Loss. Stick around and watch Wildlife. We'll see you back in about two hours. Enjoy. Thank you. Okay, what do you think of this lovely film, Wildlife, Frank Paul Green? If you want to come down, come down. We'll make this more intimate. Come on. Frank, great job. Thanks so much for coming out. It's all yours. Thank you. And yeah. Okay, do we have any questions from the audience? Please raise your hand. Any questions? I was asked one question already. Oh, yes, yes. What inspired the topic? Um, by the topic, I assume you mean the, the sexual abuse aspect of the movie. Um, it wasn't, it, I mean, I guess it was an inspiration. It's something, a topic that I've been having, sort of having my eye on for a long time. I had some, some friends tell me some intimate, you know, experiences they had a long time ago when I was just a teenager. And then I kept hearing more experiences and just sort of opened my eyes that this was all around me and you know more so than maybe people realize especially with with women and um and when it came time to make my first feature i, I wanted to do something with a message and it just seemed like a, a topic that that i could do in a way that perhaps hadn't been shown in in, in a way before that that maybe was a little bit true more true to to what i knew of or not what i had read about and experienced and heard about you know rather than like some you know alcoholic father or something, it, you know, it's a little bit more of a, a quiet, silent, um, you know, threat, predator, attack, assault. Yes, a question over here. The question is what happens when Bart goes back? There's no script for it. Yeah, there's no script. Then what you see is what was on the page. I mean, I, it's... One of, one of the things I try to do when I'm writing is I try to not take the audience where they think they're going. And as I was writing through Wildlife and plotting out the story, it became pretty obvious through the middle of the movie that everyone thinks that, that Bart and the uncle will have a con, 
you know, confrontation at some point. So I just, I kept delaying that. And I said, well, I'll just keep putting it off so that the audience won't get it when they think they're going to get it. And then I realized I could just put it off all the way to the very <laughs> end of the script. And then, I, and then I actually thought it was a very nice creative choice because it, it, it does sort of beg the question of what's the best reaction, you know, getting back to the topic, what, you know, what is the best way forward for Bart, you know, for McKenzie, and, and how do you deal with these things going forward? And, you know, oftentimes you don't know that this is happening until it's already too late and the damage is already done, you know. So are they going to, you know, so you can turn him in the police and lock him up forever. I don't know. Is he going to beat him up? You know, McKinsey doesn't want it talked about. There's also that issue. What are you going to do? I don't know. I was really asked don't. a question on the way down. Yes. Somebody asked me, what was the address on the map? Bart's address. Yeah, Bart's address in Seattle. I'm sorry? No, he lives in Seattle, yeah. He said he lived in Seattle. Another question, yeah. please. Yes. So the question is about the, the mother, what is her situation? Yeah. Again, it's sort of, it sort of fill in the blank. There was an earlier version um, in the script where I gave a lot more backstory, although not really particularly around the mother. I mean, to me, what's important is that, yeah, she's mentally unfit, you know, for any number of reasons. Obviously, the father has died, and she really doesn't obviously have the, the energy at this time and, and the desire to take care of McKinsey, you know? She, she, she clearly decides to, to, to take some time away, you know, whether it's a health choice or whether it's a psychological issue and, and, and um, you know, and it gives McKinsey obviously an opportunity to experience other parenthood figures, we have a good question. and bad, sorry. We have a question from Twitter. How was it to direct the bear? <laughs> of course, yeah, the bear scene. I um, actually brought some photos for the first time related to the bear scene because I get that question every single time. I've only answered it like a hundred times. Um, so the bear, his name is Joe Boxer, JB for short. JB lives in, in Alaska in a place called the um, Anchorage Wildlife Conservation Center, which is this huge, massive sanctuary for wildlife of all type. And um, they are not trained, uh, but they are uh, animals that cannot survive by themselves in the wild, and so they have different enormous pens, I guess you could call them a pen, but they're literally like miles deep, that they let these animals live in, and then they just sort of watch over and make sure they're getting food and, and so forth. And JB and his sister grew up there, and we're actually filming in the enclosure in that scene, which gives you an idea just how vast and big the place is where he lives. And, the people that run it um, said, yeah, we have a bear. Um, JB was in Into the Wild, Sean Penn's movie. He was looking for his second credit, you know, so. They said, come on down, you know, pick a day and come down and we'll, we'll figure out a way to make the scene. And so we got down there and Mike, who runs the place, who's like 80 years old and bow-legged and could probably beat up all of us easily with one hand tied behind his back, he comes out with a tractor and, um, and he said, okay, I can only take like three, maybe four people in. And we said, well, we've got camera team, which is three people and two actors. And he said, okay, perfect. So he put them in the front of a front loader, a tractor front loader. And I have to have a picture of that here. And he drove the front loader into the pen, which is like these 20 foot high fences. And, uh, and then he dropped them off. And uh, he got out of the tractor with a pitchfork and a bucket of hot dogs and fish. And I guess JB just you know, smells hot dogs and fish, and so the bushes start stirring, and, and we're watching from the other side of the fence, and sure enough, JB just comes wandering out, and he starts coming towards them, and Mike says, okay, this is your chance. You know, get out there and film. And so Bruce and Ella boldly get out and sort of act, and Hillary on the camera got behind him, just starts shooting a scene with the bear walking up, and then Mike just throws a fish way over beyond JB and he turns around and goes back out. <laughs> and so JB is just coming back and forth for food, you know, doing these roundies and we're just shooting and shooting probably 30 takes, you know, of all different angles. 
And, uh, and I was watching with Ella's mom, who was crying next to me. <laughs> but, uh, but JB was good. He did, he did do a little mock charge. He rushed them about 10 feet and then stopped. Just to, animals do that, just to test, test their prey. Um, so that's JB. Uh, question back here. Why did McKenzie approach Bart sexually in the tent? Well, so McKin McKenzie as a character for me, um, you know, I think there's a lot of, there's a few different ways that, that young women and, and adult women can be affected by sexual abuse and then go down a couple of different paths, either consciously or even subconsciously. And one of the things that I wanted to explore with McKenzie is that, you know, she had this, um, subconsciously, she sort of, had this idea that intimacy led to this other, um, you know, sexual activity. And, and that also she could use her sexuality in a way to sort of manipulate or get closer or keep him where she needed because he was her ticket back to Seattle. Um, and similarly with Nolan, with uh, Tommy in the hotel room. So, you know, based on people that I talked to and research that I did, I, I felt like that was a way to show sort of some early early effects of, of what she had been going through. Another question from Twitter, was it difficult to film in Alaska? It actually was not difficult, you know, and obviously it brings a lot of bang for your buck. It's a super friendly film state. They have a big tax credit where they give you money to actually go there. Um, the locations, you know, welcomed us. Denali was, was quite difficult. We, we talked to them for about two years before they allowed us to film there. But most part, it was really friendly. I mean, we traveled a great distance, but everyone was super friendly. They had a great crew and, you know, gave us food and showed us around and were very enthusiastic. And we had great weather. It was in August. So I highly recommend you visit. Yes, sir. In the glacier specifically? Was there a metaphor with the glacier and the cinematography? Well, in the, in the cinematography in, in particular, I decided to, you know, do two things. One, we have sort of huge landscapes, and then you also have very tight, compressed shots on McKenzie, often because of the pressure that she feels, despite the fact that she's in this enormous landscape. Um, and with the glacier, you know, it's not direct, directly symbolic, but I think it's you know, going to Alaska and being in that environment, it's so vast, it's so beautiful, and when you see the glacier, it's something you've never, you don't typically see. It's just, it, it's one of those things that awakens, you know, makes you rethink what's going on or rethink priorities or sort of, you know, it adds a level of spirituality to your experience, and, and obviously that's what both Bart and McKinsey need. So, you know, having them arrive at that glacier at that time where he's at a pivotal moment of, do I let this girl follow me or do I turn her into the police? You know, and she's at a moment of desperation where she has absolutely nowhere else to go. I think it's, it is, you know, intent, intentional that they arrive at the glacier at that time. Yes, John. It, it, it wasn't so much of a first choice. It was just a process for auditioning McKinsey. Ella Purnell plays McKinsey. Um, I knew I wanted um, a girl that was close to the age of the character. I knew I wanted someone that, that everyone hadn't seen before. Um, and I knew I wanted someone who could act and perform in this sort of style and tone of film. And um, so that was challenging. And I had a casting director, and she put out casting calls around the country. And I saw a lot of videos of girls. And I went on a trip to Los Angeles and met with some agents and agencies and met with some young girls. And I saw a lot of, like, girls who had been on Disney shows and Nickelodeon channel, and they are all very talented in lots of different ways, but nothing that proved to me that they could do what I wanted there. And, um, and I went back to the hotel room, I was sort of like, all right, well, this trip was a waste of time. I turned on the television and saw a movie called Never Let Me Go. Ella Purnell's in that movie. She plays a young version of Kira Knightley. And she just had this, you know, presence that was really terrific. I actually thought she was too beautiful for the part. I was not looking for a really pretty girl. But she just had this amazing presence, and I had this gut feeling that she was correct. I happened to have just met with her agent that day, and I called the agent on the cell phone, like, late at night. And I said, I just saw Ella Purnell. I don't know why you didn't show her to me. And she said, well, you know, she's British. And I said, well, can she do an American accent? She said, oh, yeah, sure, of course she can. So 
So Ella started learning American English immediately. So she came on like two years before we shot the movie. So once she was on board and it was very locked, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, more questions. questions. Got one right here. Right. Mm, well, if I was a if I was a, a woman or young girl who had been sexually abused, which I'm not, I would probably answer that question pretty aggressively. You know, I, my ex, my understanding is that you know a lot of people who've been sexually abused will go to the ends of the earth to not actually speak about the experience. Um, it's incredibly difficult to go through to relive, to speak about. There's a lot of shame involved, a lot of confusion. So it's actually very reflective of the issue is, you know, unfortunately, we don't know, you know, how many people are sexually abused because most of the victims don't ever talk about it at all, much less go to the lengths of prosecuting. So, that, so she absolutely, part of the purpose of the film was that she was not going to reveal what happened. Even when, he know, even when she knows he knows, she says nothing happened, even though she, he knows he can read, he, he knows something happened. She says, nothing happened, nothing happened, just forget it. That's, that's indicative of the problem. To uncle, to uncle, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Anyone in the back? Yes, yes, we're there. Um, the a cappella song. It's a, it's a traditional Irish song called The Parting Glass, and that performance is by a group called the Wailing, Wailing Jennies. That's J-E-N-N-Y-S. It's a beautiful female, you know, folk singer-songwriter trio. And, um, yeah, they were generous enough to let us use the song. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Yeah, the question is about the, uh, the first time you see the uncle abusing her, and it was hard to tell whether or not she was resistant to it. Yeah, I, I think in, you know, in similar response to a couple of the other questions around the issue, um, I think as surprising as it may seem to, you know, you know, to me or to maybe some others, I, I think that, that freezing up is a pretty common reaction to that situation. Um, and in my mind, actually, this isn't the first time that the uncle has done this to her specifically. So even on top of that fact, she's still, you know, locking up. Um, it's, you know, I can't explain it because I haven't been through it, but I know that it happens more often than not. And I think that it's, you know, and I think that's probably also, you know, maybe when sometimes I see it in movies and TV and I see it done in a different way, I think to myself, that's not, what I know about that, you know, I don't think that that's reflecting the issue. And what's really interesting is that the, the male perspective on the issue, after doing dozens and dozens of Q, Q and A's, I find that the male perspective on the issue and the female perspective of the issue are so different. And it's really interesting to see, you know, their reactions to the issue, which just, you know, bears more the reason to bring it out and show it. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Can you tell us what's happening next with the film? Um, oh yeah, sure. Um, so the movie's coming out to um, a bunch of cities on September 25th, and on demand, and online, and all those great places. And um, we would love to tell you all about it. So if you love the movie, or if you want to share it with someone, you can tell them, you know, to go see it. You can either 
give us your email on our website. I have a book here. You can come up and write your email down. And um, we'll tell you all about it coming out. You can buy a DVD, whatever. So it's an independent film. You guys are the ones that get it out there. We don't, we're not advertising on television. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for, thanks thanks for the film festival.